Hey, everybody. Um, hello. Welcome to our chaotic free for all. We don't know what's going to happen now. Um, we'll see. Uh, thanks so much. This is Nikki and, and Beckett Method have um, are straining to make this work. It's very complicated. Um, and we're so grateful for what they're doing. And I am personally really grateful for all of the entries that you guys sent into my contest because um, this has been a weird book release and uh, I've been sitting at home mostly and it doesn't feel real in a lot of ways and all of our events have been like this where we're sitting in a room and it's just a little like wah wah you know what I mean <laughs> I mean not that it hasn't been great but like is it really happening I just feel so shut off and and the co communication that I had from you guys uh, just made it feel like I was meeting people like I get to do usually. And I was, I was getting to talk to people. I mean, I wasn't talking, but listening was, is the good part. And, and all of your stories really, I mean, all of them, they all really struck something in me. And, and I really wanted a chance to do, to do something with you. So I'm glad that this worked out and that Method was able to pull it together for us because this is the event I've been just the most excited for. Um, and I'm so grateful that you guys are here. And I'm grateful for our, inter our interpreters. That's amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, so we'll go ahead to start out with some questions. And we're going to start by, Megan's going to read ones that you've written in. Oh, by the way, this is Megan Hibbett. Hi. She is my partner in crime and my quarantine buddy. And she has been helping me do all of these events and has been invaluable. So she's going to read some. And then we'll get to one that we're going to try and pull someone in. And that will be the first test to see if this actually works. Just everyone, let's all take a collective deep breath. Just settle in for the ride. We're gonna try, I have 15 pages of questions. We're gonna try to get through as many as we possibly can. Some of you, a lot of you asked very similar questions. So uh, those will be grouped together just so we can try and move through um, and are you ready? Yeah. Method? Let's do it. I'm going to go. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, first question is from Eleanor. Why did you decide to rewrite Twilight and Edward's perspective? Can you go take us back? I'm going to go back. <laughs> Thanks, Eleanor. Um, so to the very beginning, I had written Twilight. Much to my surprise, it got published. I was working on sequels. Um, and it had occurred to me, I think I was editing at that point. So when I'm editing, I get bored. And I was thinking about how um, the first of Twilight, compared to how Edward experienced it, Bella's experience is very, very dull. Like she goes to school, she sees a really pretty boy and he's mean to her. I mean, that would have been exciting for me in high school, <laughs> but, oh, yeah, me too. but Edward goes to school expecting a regular day and almost kills 20 people. Um, and that to me was a lot more exciting. So I kind of wanted to see if I'd written from the vampire's perspective, what it would look like. And I only plan to do the first chapter because that's my brain lies to me all the time. And it's like, yeah, we can do it. Let's just see. And then I loved it. I loved how the world looked through inhuman eyes. I loved the bloodlust and the mayhem and like how he, it would have been. And that was really exciting. So I kind of kept going. And at first it was a pretty easy, like fun thing. But as the book continues, Bella becomes more and more involved. And then all of a sudden I started running into these scenes that were totally choreographed. Every movement he makes, she's watched. Every word that he said is recorded. And I had not a lot of room to be creative. And that is what all of a sudden hit the brakes. And I, it was very slow from that point on. And then it sped up again a little bit at the end, um, which I finished, you know, last year I was working on, um, where Bella is away from Edward again. And then I was back to being able to create new things. And so that, that sped the process up. This is from Arlena. Also, let me just say, I'm going to do my best with your names too. So if I get it wrong, very sorry. Um, so Arlena, <laughs> I hope that's close. Um, what changed your mind about publishing Midnight Sun? Well, I don't know that, I mean, I, there's- I guess finishing and publishing. I yeah, so the thing is that I, it was finishing it. Um, I mean, I guess I, I always, when I'm writing a book, I, to finish it, I have to tell myself that I'm never gonna publish it. No one's ever gonna see it but me, so it's okay. I can keep writing and I can, not worry about other people's reactions because I lied to myself that no one else is going to see it. So I'm sure there were a lot of places in the Night Sun um, where it was easy to say, you don't have to worry about 
anything, just write it for yourself. Um, that helps me a lot. So I didn't, but I wasn't like, I didn't reach a point where I was like, well, I'll never publish this um, beyond just that, that self lie, but I couldn't publish it till it was finished. So it was the long 12 year process. And then when I knew I was going to finish it and I realized, okay, this is going to happen. I started the publishing process immediately. I told my editor and my publisher, like, I think I'm going to have this before Christmas. Um, should we get it out next summer? And we started down that road. And then COVID happened. And then COVID happened. <laughs> this is from Annie. Uh, what was the best part about writing from Edward's perspective? Um, I think the best part uh, were the times when you don't feel like a human being, where I could kind of get into his mind and have more abilities and also have the like moral ambiguity of maybe I kill a bunch of people. <laughs> okay, I've done it before, right? So I mean, it's just a, a whole, it's a, it's a harsher viewpoint in a lot of ways, but that kind of is a fun thing to, to explore. Yeah. Um, did you, Sierra would like to know, did you discover anything new or surprising about Edward um, while you were writing from his point of view? Not really. Um, I knew pretty much how Edward was feeling the whole time that we were, that I was writing Twilight. So, and then I'd written the other book, so I knew Edward really, really well, and it was all kind of there. I mean, for me, it's there in Twilight. I can look at a page, I know what Edward's thinking, and, and I didn't have to, there wasn't, there wasn't any big surprises because I'd already written Twilight. Yeah. Okay, um, Kaylee, you're next, and you're, I think, coming up on video. Here's our first experiment. Everybody cross your fingers. Uh, can you see me? I hear you. I, I hear you. Hi. <laughs> uh, my <laughs> name is Kaylee. Hey, Kaylee. Kylie. Oh, Kylie. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Guys, it worked. It worked. Like, like a virtual Good job, guys. high five. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> Kaylee. Kylie. What is it? Say your name. Kylie. Kylie. Okay. Um, you had a question about whether, um, about if Edward had been able to read Bella's mind, would he have? Right. Dot, dot, dot. Oh, yeah, what would have been different? So you're saying, like, what would have changed if Edward, had, if Bella hadn't had her mysterious mind shield, right? Yeah. Okay. So I think he still would have fallen in love with her. Um, his first reaction would have been, especially in that moment, I think he would, in the cafeteria, right? If he'd heard her mind at that point when she's sitting there feeling all awkward, um, I think he first would have felt some pity, right? Because she's, she's very sweet and like she's kind of innocent with these other people all staring at her. But then when she's like immediately like, who is that most beautiful person I've ever seen? <laughs> I think then he would have been like, awkward you know <laughs> here we go again right that because he's been there before um and so that would have been that reaction like well we're going to go down this road um would he have said something to Emmett probably just to rub it in? she's not looking at you Emmett um and then uh he got to biology and then everything goes away again exactly the same way where it's all about how she smells and trying not to kill her and then when he came back he wouldn't have had so much in focus and intensity into what she's thinking. Like that is all of his focus. And, and he wouldn't have had to do that, but I, he still would have been so aware of her. And because of who <laughs> she is as a person, I, maybe he would have fallen in love with her faster even. Because Ooh. he could have assumed, you know, that she was thinking like normal people, but he would have seen them right away how kind she was. He wouldn't have had to watch for all the little signs. So they still were meant to be together either way. That's Aww. a good question. Thanks, Kylie. Thank Thank you. Okay, we awesome. haven't discussed what we do next method. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can. I'm afraid if I can stop you? it, I'm going to get disconnected. No, yeah, I'll, I'll kick you out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for being our <laughs> guinea pig. You did a great job. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. Everyone, Thanks for everybody for raising your hands. This is really thank working you. well. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. 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 Awesome. That was amazing. That really well. Now, I'm on a Good real job, high now. All right. It worked. Okay. Addie, um, is it possible that Edward could have loved, this is sort of tied into your, is it the last question, is it possible that someone could have 
um, that Edward could have loved someone else if Bella had never existed or if she had remained in Arizona rather than moving to Forks. I mean, it's possible, right? Edward's going to be alive forever, basically, and, and there's a lot of different types of people that he could run into. Um, but if you're going with the, the theory of soulmates and that they belong together, which is kind of where I was when I was writing this, then she is the one for him. Now, if she had, you know, died of pneumonia when she was four, um, probably he would have not. I mean, but he wasn't looking. Edward wasn't looking for a romantic partner. He was, he was pretty satisfied in, in himself and his life and self-sufficient. So um, maybe he never would have looked at anybody that way. I don't know. But Bella did happen, and that was the trajectory of his life. She did add, or would he have truly been alone forever? He's no. not alone, man. <laughs> he loves his family. They're all good. They're all good. I'm just trying to see if this, no, nope. okay. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, okay, this is from Joyce. What is your favorite characteristic of Alice and Jasper's relationship? Um, they are an interesting, like, couple because they're both, uh, very special. Um, I think it would be more annoying to date Alice uh, because you really would have to get used to the whole, like she knows everything that's going to happen and she's one step ahead of you all the time. And, um, and you know, Jasper rolls with it, obviously, because he's besotted. But I think being um, engaged, like with, with Jasper, if like he was your person, there's like no downside to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he would always know if he did something weird that made you feel weird, he would know immediately and he could apologize. Right. And he would want to apologize, unlike a lot of men, because he would feel that you're upset and that would make him unhappy. So you being happy makes him happy. There, there's, no, there's no bad downside to that. He would be great. <laughs> oh, Jasper. Jasper is my favorite. Um, Yvette would like to know what inspired the vampire sparkly skin. Okay. So Yvette, um, the sparkly skin was out of the first dream that I had, well, the, the dream that I had <laughs> that I started writing from. So it came from my subconscious and I have literally no idea. First of all, I had not been thinking, reading or watching anything about vampires. Like that was not in my head. I had never before considered the idea that vampires might do pyrotechnics in the sunshine. So it just, I don't know what my subconscious was on about, but it worked out pretty great. Okay, the next question is from Sarah. Uh, where did the literary device to create the pages with only the month names for New Moon come from? And I would like to add to that question, did, did you purposely intend to wreck all of our lives <laughs> okay. with those pages? So it wrecked my life too when I had to write <laughs> Edward leaving Bella. And because I have to put myself into Bella, I'm being left, right? I had to, I had to go through that pain. So as I was, you know, he leaves and then what? And so I'm, I'm looking at this and I, I create calendars and stuff to keep things straight where I am in the story, when things are going to happen. And I had, and I'm like thinking, when is Bella going to recover? Eh, I'll give her, you know, January when she kind of has to pull herself out of the out of the the mire. I mean, she's doing the she's doing the stuff. She's getting good grades. She's trying, but you know her head submerged. Um, and so then I had these four months, right? Mm -hmm. And I actually had typed them out. Like, what happens? Because nothing's going to happen. What happens in in October? Nothing. What happens in November? Nothing. Yeah. And so I typed them out, and I liked I put them on separate pages. And I I was like, can I do this? Is this against the rules? I feel that way a lot when I'm writing. Am I breaking a rule? And then I say, you know what? It doesn't matter. If my editors have a problem with it, you know, then we'll, I'll fix it then. But I just left it because there, something about the emptiness of those pages really spoke to me. And I was like, I'm going to see what happens. And then I really looked how that, it looked really great in the book. When it was like bound up, I'm like, yes. Well, I'm glad you liked the way it looked while it broke <laughs> the rest of our hearts. Okay, Tracy, um, you're next and we're calling you up into the video uh -huh. okay all right i see you Hello. awesome <laughs> this is fantastic thank you so much for doing this um okay tracy you had a question about the creative process in terms of 
um, screenplays and the movies and you know what deal breakers were and all right yeah so I read I reread all the books and rewatched all the movies uh, in as I was waiting for uh, the book to come out and little changes stood out more because I was kind of doing them together reading and then watching and you know something like Angela dating Eric instead of Ben in yeah yeah and so I was curious about how you handled things that you might have had to let go of from the books in order to make the movies happen in such a tight time frame. How did you handle that? And what were the deal breaker items for you that you were like, nope, not changing that? Well, well on the first movie, I didn't get deal breakers. <laughs> like it was, I was lucky to be wrong for the ride. Um, I saw the script early and I was able to say, could we maybe? And the answer was always no. The only thing I got um, in the script was uh, the just adding in Edward playing the piano. I'm like, they're gonna want that. They, I, it has no, it had no mention of him playing piano at all. I'm like, I know this is something that the fans will, will want to see. Um, so uh, with the first one, there was just a lot of me saying, okay, you know what, it's fine. This is a separate artistic yeah. endeavor. This is its own animal. It is inspired by my work, but it's its own thing. And so I kind of looked at it that way. I mean, it was really exciting to have a movie made. Um, it was exciting. I got to go to set, I think twice, um, and kind of see people getting into my characters, which was super cool. I think they all made versions of the characters that are super recognizable, and yet they brought something of their own to it. And so, um, and that is something new, like you were watching the movies and the books, right? So you're like, okay, this is my Bella, but then what an interesting other version of Bella. So it's like adding to, I don't feel like it's taking away. And then as the movies went on, I had a little bit more say in things, but generally we were mostly on the same page. And, and I understood the fact that I am long-winded. And when <laughs> you do a book the size of, let's say Eclipse into two hours, things get lost and you just have to accept that. And, and, and I don't think that they pulled too many things that were like, they didn't pull anything that had to happen. Yeah. They, they got the stuff in that needed to. It's, it's always hard watching it get just shrunk down. Um, but if I, if I could get something back from all of it, it would be the blood typing scene in Twilight. That I would have that was Nicole's question. Oh. What was next? Oh, Hey, sorry, Nicole, Let's step <laughs> on your toes. But that's the one that I, that I would have wanted back was, uh, Blood typing was always a lot of fun. And it's like the first time that he really like touches her. Yeah, man. Come on. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Tracy. Okay, we'll wait. Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. We're back. Okay. Okay. <laughs> there okay. we are. It yeah. worked twice. Okay. Uh, Chelsea would like to know, what's what was one of your biggest struggles while writing New Moon? Oh, gosh. Just having to be rejected. Because I was rejected, man. I had to live that. Um, but I, uh, and this is something that I, I feel like there are some people who really like Jacob and some people who really don't. They feel like Jacob is this uninvited intruder who has stepped into the perfect romance. And I see that. I absolutely understand where you're coming from, but I'm in this writing it. I'm in this very dark place because Bella feels horrible. I mean, I got broken up with in high school and I was not broken up with by Edward Cullen. Let me tell you, <laughs> nothing close. But I didn't feel great about it. Like that wasn't a fun experience. And if you if I if you dial it up to eleven and it's Edward Cullen who's left you, that's a whole other thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so I I wanted to convey that like this was true love. This wasn't romance, you know. And like oh, I saw a cute boy at school and he asked for my number. This is true love. Um, and so I had to like, what does that feel like? And then I have to experience it. And that was not fun. But so then this character comes in who made everything better. Not everything, but like it feels better. When he was on screen, so to speak, things were lighter and I was smiling again. It was like, oh, if I can be in a scene with, with Jacob, then all of this feels better, which is very similar to how Bella was. Like this is what was feeling better for her was this person who brought the sunshine. So I am always grateful to Jacob because he was able to do that. And that's one of the reasons why I love him because he saved me from New Moon. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's, you know, it's a real thing. Um, what was the hardest part of writing the whole series? Who's asking? This is from Jade. Okay, Jade. Uh, well, I mean, originally, uh, Twilight was super easy and fast to write. Um, 
And then I wrote Forever Dawn, which is also super fast, but not super great. Like it's, it's a little bit of a mess. Um, and then I had to go back and go into New Moon. And when I did that, that was the first time that I knew that people were going to be waiting for this book. Like my editors were waiting, people were going to read this. And that was immense pressure for me. Um, I, I, you know, I do the line in myself thing, but I can only succeed so far. Um, and so going forward, that was really rough. And I thought that was the hardest thing until I tried to write for Midnight Sun. And then I realized the real hardest thing is writing a book when you already have a script and you have to follow, follow every word. So that sort of ties into Monique's question. I think we have your answer, but her question was, did you enjoy writing the story more from <laughs> Bella or Edward's perspective? Bella is like the happiest person in the world compared to Edward. And in Twilight, she is falling in love and everything's beautiful. And that is a good mental state to be in, right? Sure, there's mystery, sure there's danger, but mostly there's falling in love. With Edward, mostly there is self-castigation, there is suffering, there is guilt, not as much fun. Um, Paige would like to know, do you know if they will be making a movie for, or I'll throw in TV show for Midnight Sun? Okay, well, the only they. person, <laughs> they is me. I Right now, I own the rights. Nobody has rights to it except for me. So it's, and I do know that there are people that would be excited to try. Um, but right, I, you know, I, I didn't want to focus on that and I'm, I'm torn about it because I, it was fun to do the other movies. Um, there were things that never quite satisfied me, uh, mostly in the special effects world where the actors were all human beings and they all looked like human beings and, and they're beautiful. I mean, they're better looking than the rest of us because they're beautiful actors, but, but they just, to me, it wasn't quite vampires. Um, and their way they moved was like human beings because they are human beings. Um, and so I have kicked around the idea of maybe an animated version, which I think would be cool because the other problem with making the movie and somebody I, I saw before we started, somebody asked about, um, oh, it's Paige, it it's right Paige. there. Yeah. Oh, oh, so this is Paige. So Paige yeah, had yeah. another question that she typed out about would it be the same cast? And there's no way to do that because Rob and Kristen are in their 30s now. They're not 17 anymore. Um, and I like movies where people look like they're supposed to age-wise. Um, and and they're all, you know, also they are major movie stars who do lots of work. They're very yeah. busy. I don't think they'd want <laughs> to. Come back. Yeah. So so no, uh, we couldn't have the original actors. So then we bring in new actors. How do people feel about that? I think there's going to be a lot of that's not my Edward you know, and this person's worse than, and this person's better than, that's all kind of cruel and unnecessary. <laughs> um, and, and then we'd still have human beings. I, I kind of want to see what it'd be like if we, if we had no limits to our, what we could do with special effects because it's all animated. But then there's other, you know, like how do we do Edward's mind reading? How do we get that feeling of the constant surround of voices without it being really hard to watch. I don't know if it's possible. I'm still thinking about it. Um, it would be fun, but we'll see. You just, you just mapped it all out just now. <laughs> I th I've thought a lot about it. Um, okay. Uh, DJ is next and I believe he'll be coming into okay, video. Okay. Here we go again. Everybody cross their fingers. Good wishes. I see. There, I see. Yes. All right. I feel like we, I feel like I'm winning a gold medal every time somebody comes. <laughs> well, actually, it's, it's Nikki and Becca winning the yeah, gold okay. medal, but fine. Hi, Hello. DJ. Hi, nice um, to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, I just wanted to ask, you know, how has your creative or writing process changed over the course of your career as you've, you know, continued to write novels, you've done a novella, um, and as you work in film, I'm just kind of curious how your creative process might have changed. Well, it's gotten a lot slower is kind of the main thing. Um, when I started, uh, I had didn't have a lot of creative outlets. And so I feel like it was kind of building up in me. Um, and so when I wrote Twilight, it was just like, I had so much, like a dam that burst. There was so many words and I was just flowing with it. Um, I have to work more for it now. I, it doesn't, it doesn't come as naturally. With Twilight, it was like the story was writing itself and I was just typing to catch up. Um, and there's a little bit of that. There'll, there'll be scenes everywhere where that happens. Midnight Sun, the scene that did that for me was the chase scene on the on highway. That one I was just keeping up with with how the story went. Um, 
it's a it's a different thing uh, working with scripts and producing, particularly when it's not my own stuff. You know, it's a very you're much more removed, and there are a lot more compromises because when you're writing a story, it's all you, and you can have as many helicopters blow up as you want because there is no budget. <laughs> Um, then you get into a real world and they're like, maybe we only have three people in this scene. And, and maybe like, it's not a helicopter. Maybe, maybe it's, it's a car. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it's a horse. It's, yeah. Well, horses are worse. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, that's a completely different process. For me, that's not as creative a process. I love seeing things turn into a visual medium, but that is a lot less like of your control. Um, writing is the real creative outlet for me. And that hasn't changed that much. I wish I could change the process of like when I write, I do it in the middle of the night and it's super frustrating. Um, if I could write in the daytime, that would, that would really help me out. But so far, that's just how I do it. <laughs> I have to say too, DJ, for those of you who do not know, has some of the prettiest Instagram photos oh, of thank books you so much. And other things I have ever seen. So go find him and, and look at them and follow him. And you're going to have things. to look at them. You're going to have to show me. Yeah. Thank and you. He, has, so cool. he also has very good book recommendations. That's another thing. When you find a person who recommends books you love, hold on to them and never let go. It's a great <laughs> thing. Thank you so much, DJ. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. Thanks. You too. Um, Yay, okay. Works. All right. Clarissa would like to know. Clarissa, great name. Uh, what is was it difficult letting other people edit your books into movies and if you could change oh yeah and that's it we got we got yeah. oh, this? okay no was it difficult letting oh. other people edit your books into movies oh i mean well we kind of talked about oh. that like you have to it it can be because i can be a real stickler for um like but this is what happened you know <laughs> i i feel like that way about what i've written it's like but that's what happened and i re you do have to stay take a step back and it helped that on twilight i didn't have any ability to say what was going on so i was forced to take a step back and and look at it in a different way you know this is somebody else's version of my story and i get to sit back and watch um and so and so that's that's cool it it's it can be hard you know there are things that you're like oh but that's that's not the tone of voice he said that in. And in fact, when we were doing um, the, the Midnight Sun audiobook, which my friend Jake did an amazing job with, and most of the time I would just sit, he would send me pieces and I would listen to it and be like, oh, there it is, there it is. But I remember listening to one um, and I just was jarred and I said, that's not how he said it. And I had to call him and be like, no, it's like this. And I said it like 14 times and, and he's like, I got it, Stephanie. <laughs> Let him create. Let him create. Um, speaking of Jake Abel, if you guys haven't watched his Jake and Quarantine stuff <laughs> on Instagram, don't spoil it because it's legit one of the coolest, most creative things I've ever seen and had me going, like texting him and saying, do I need to send somebody to help you? <laughs> because this is all very scary. Anyway, go watch it. It's very good. Um, Lily would like to know, how do you go about editing slash revising your books on the second draft? So it would be hard to quantify what is the second draft. So while I'm writing, let's say I, I've written five chapters. Every time I go back into writing, I start at the beginning, I read through, I'm making changes that the whole time. And then I'll write to chapter eight and then I'll go back and make changes. So I'm constantly editing. I editing for me, self-editing is a lot easier than writing because it's already there. And then I can just get the perfect word or change something a, that's a little bit without having to create the whole thing. Um, so I love to just read and make small changes. Now, when an editor comes in and says, what if this character is dead? <laughs> and you're like, but the whole story is about this. Oh, um, that's really hard for me because I do have that weird sense of, but this is what happened. Um, and I have to balance that and listen to my editor and be like, okay, why is this not working? Um, usually I'll kind of come at it from a little different way. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it can be, it can be challenging. Um, but definitely by the time the book is finished, I've edited through it a million times. Uh, and then it's, and then it's the editor's job. And I think of that as the second draft is yep. the editorial editing, which is, can be really challenging. Okay. Uh, Lena. All right. We're going to call you in, I think. Yeah. Yes. It's happening. Hello. Hi. It's very nice to okay. meet you guys. This is awesome. Nice to meet you too. Thanks for coming tonight. So you, you, had, a question, you had a question about um, the hardest chapter to convert 
Yes. So I was wondering what was the hardest chapter to convert from like Bella's perspective in Twilight to Edward's perspective in Midnight Sun? I mean, it could just be based off dialogue or whatever. That's a big part of it. Um, there were two elements that made it the hardest. Um, and the hardest chapter was the meadow scene. Mm -hmm. The very first of it that I got to write the piece that was always missing was great. That was fantastic. But then I'm locked into a chapter where the whole thing is very intense conversation. And so everything he does has been mapped out. Everything he says, she's paid great deal of attention to. So I'm writing within those constraints. So that's hard already. Mm -hmm. Any chapter where it's a lot of talking is hard. And then I also know it's kind of the most important chapter. And it was the first chapter I wrote of Twilight and there was so much weight to it. And I wanted it to be special. And there's nothing that's harder than knowing I've got to make this special and I don't know how. <laughs> So that was, that was a challenging one. And I would guess that I probably spent two years off and on on that chapter. Oh, wow. It was a gigantic roadblock yeah. and I would do a piece and I would get mad and I'd walk away. And that probably took me the longest of anything, just forcing myself back in to get through that chapter. It was very, very tough. Well, you did a great job. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Selena. Yay. Okay, um, let's see. Lexi wants to know what the craziest, uh, best, or funniest thing you have done during this quarantine. Can I answer for you? I mean, it's not very crazy or exciting, <laughs> but go ahead. Stephanie has really gotten into uh, artificial succulents. Fake succulents. So I had this empty mantle. I really <laughs> wanted it to look nice, but it had some difficulties because the TV was eight inches over the mantle that filled the whole thing. My husband likes big TVs. It's a thing with him. And so I needed something low and I'm like, I could do like some pots with succulents. There's like 40 pots on there now. They look great. It looks great. Um, but then I put some other places and I got kind of addicted to ordering my succulents and I keep making new ones and it's a problem. It's a whole I have thing. to stop. Um, you don't have to stop. Love what you love. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, when my family can't sit down and they're going through the forest <laughs> the of succulents, that's a problem. Um, Miss, you would like to know what your favorite movie or TV series based off a book is? Um, currently, so this is this is my reward. I I don't watch TV. Our reward. Well, our reward. Yes, she was asking me. Don't take <laughs> it away from me. Um, I don't watch a lot of TV because uh, if I'm in a story, I don't want to be distracted. I don't like getting into things where I know that there's going to be a bunch of time I have to spend. Um, shorter things are easier. Like the last thing I watched, and this is not based on a book, but I am so far behind. When I finished Midnight Sun, my reward was I got to watch Downton Abbey, which I'd never seen. Watched it all the way through. Yes, I know. I am way behind. I knew I was going to like it, but I, I knew I couldn't watch it because it was going to take a really long time to watch it. So yes. But so the one that I'm watching tomorrow that I'm real excited about is Umbrella Academy 2, based on a graphic novel, so it counts. It counts. Um, and uh, I loved the first one so, so, so much, and I can't wait, and I am in love with Klaus, so. Yeah. And then the best movie yeah. ever made from a book, in my opinion, is Ang Lee's Sense and Sensibility, Perfection. Yeah, I would say Brokeback Mountain, also Ang Lee. He's great. <laughs> um, okay, Jenny, we're gonna call Jenny in. Ooh think. Yep. Ah, great. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Jenny had Hi. some questions about um, added scenes. Okay. For, in Midnight Sun. New scenes. Yeah. So um, for instance, like the Christmas scene between Edward and Carlisle or the different facts that we learn about Bella. Um, like she's a Star Wars fan. Did you know that the entire time you were writing the series or were these little surprises that you kind of discovered? as you were writing Midnight Sun Alone? Um, I don't know if I'd call them surprises, but, but it's a good catch. And uh, what happens is, is when I was, so when I'm writing Twilight and Edward's asking all these questions and she is totally uninterested in herself. And so she glosses over it. He asked me a million questions and I answered them because she, you know I knew that she didn't want to get into all these things about herself because all she cares about is him, that is it. Um, so I knew that was there. And at the time I kind of thought about some of the things that she might be revealing and some of the things she might be saying, but I didn't, they weren't set in stone. And when I write, um, people like to ask me things like, 
what did Carlisle and Esme do on a Tuesday in September <laughs> of 1956? And I could do that. I could create a story. But if I do, then it's, it's done. And I might at some point need a story from that time period that then doesn't work with that. Um, the same way with the birthdays. Everyone wants to know when their birthdays are because it's not in the guide. It's like, but I might need that. What if I need a birthday party in the next book and I need one in October and it doesn't work? <laughs> Um, so I, I leave it in the ether and it's floating out there. And then as I'm like, okay, I need a flashback now that gives some insight into Edward and Carlisle's relationship and also is like a trigger for why Edward left Carlisle. Um, and so then I kind of pull together the pieces of what I knew that they were doing and whatnot. But like that specific, the Christmas scene, that didn't exist anywhere in my head until I was looking for a way to do those things. So some of it was like, was like I knew there were things out there and then other things were like okay let's here's a new one let's let's bring it in yeah. all right does that help it does and actually do you mind if I kind of bounce off of something that you just mentioned sure, sure. about the birthdays um so my birthday is June 20th and in the guide it says Edward's birthday is June 20th 20th and I've always wanted to know was that just like a fluke did you just pick that day or I don't know did it have some kind of meaning um I liked the idea of a June birthday. Uh, my, my oldest son is a June baby. Um, and I've always thought that was, was just kind of a really beautiful month to be born in. So it didn't have any meaning in the story, um, but it just seemed like like the best birthday. So it's kind of cool that I gave him the best birthday and you got it too. So that's very nice. <laughs> Happy late great. birthday. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> For answering that, I asked it for the Barnes and Noble Q and A, but it didn't get answered, so I thought I'd throw it in here. Yeah, it's hard to. There's a lot of questions. Lot so I'm glad we got that here. one. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks so much. It was nice to meet you too. <laughs> Bye. Okay, she is adorable. Um, Katie would like to know. You touched on this a little bit, but I thought this is an interesting take on it. Um, your original telling of how you were able to write Twilight with three kids inspired me, her, uh, as she's also a, a mama of three little humans. Uh, do you have any advice for someone who is trying to do the same thing? And how do you jump the hurdles of distraction and may <laughs> mayhem? I mean, I wish I had like a really good, oh, it's easy, just do this kind of answer. Um, when I was writing at that period of time when my kids were little, the only way I could do it was to sacrifice sleep. I mean, something had to go, right? Um, and during the day, my kids' needs were mostly physical at that point. They, they didn't need to have big, deep conversations with me about the world because you know they were watching Teletubbies. Um, but so I, I had to physically care for them, but my mind could be a million other places, and it was. I was just plotting and what happens next and dialogue was going. and. Um, so that was kind of, you know, where I was. And then, but to write it down, I had to stay up and my kids never really slept. And so I did not sleep a lot. And I have to say, I'm still a little weird about sleep. Um, little PTSD, <laughs> Megan knows she's traveled with me. Windows have to be blacked out and sound machines come with me. And still there's all these problems, but I am super psycho about sleep now because I was so sleep deprived for so long. So that's not a happy answer. <laughs> I hope that your kids let you sleep during most of the night and that you have a window where you can work or your husband will put them to bed so you have time to work there, there. but it does pass quicker than you think. And that like, so my youngest graduated from high school this last year and uh, I'm about to be an empty nester when COVID lets them go back to school, which they're just chomping at the bit to do. Um, <laughs> And, and now I have nothing but empty time. And I sure do miss the little babies that kept me up all night. Um, Mackenzie would like to know which story moves you no matter how many times you read it. Other people's stories? Yeah. Um, I never don't cry when I read Anne of Green Gables and Matthew dies. Sorry, if that's a spoiler. It's been out for a hundred years. Um, and also when she loses baby joy um, every time. And I'm, and I'm always moved by kind of her, she does a lot of, it's long, you know, it's a, it's a big series. There's a lot of books, but she does a lot of emotional growth. She doesn't just stay the same. And so I, I love, I love to read her progress again and again. Um, I don't know, there's probably a lot of them because the ones I read again and again are the ones that do um, speak to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Um, okay. Lots of people had this question, so I'm going to group some of you together, and not even all of you. <laughs> There's so many. Kelsey <laughs> oh, sure. and Maya and Autumn and Ellie and Leslie and on and on uh, would like to know if you're going to continue the Twilight series uh, through Edward's point of view. No, I am not. And uh, as I said before, writing as Edward is um, difficult in two ways. The biggest one being that if I did New Moon, oh, I can't even just the thought, just the thought of trying to do New Moon. <laughs> yes, seriously. It murders me. Um, new Moon actually, on the one hand, he's not there as much, so it would be new stuff, but it would be all hideous suffering. It's like curl up in a ball and sob suffering. I can't, I can't do that to myself. And then you get to the happier books, like Eclipse and, Min and Breaking Dawn, and then we're right back in the same place where I can't write anything new. It's all just everything that already happened, which is not exciting, and it makes me write very, very slow. So I have ruled out that possibility completely. Um, I do not want to write backwards anymore. So I don't want to do stories about things that happened in the past to any of them. I just want to write where the motion is going forward. I want to write with the momentum. So that's, that's where I'll go in this series. Um, okay, Lori, we're going to bring Lori in. This is exciting when you're waiting to see their faces. <laughs> I think we're bringing in Lori. Bringing in Lori. Yep, yep, we've got a Lori. Am I there? Yay! Hi! Hi! Hi. Okay, um, go ahead. Can, can you see me? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. This means so much to all of us, I just have to tell you. Um, my question is, regarding Chapter 13, obviously in Twilight, that's your inspiration. What inspired you with your other books, like The Host, The Chemist, as well as like all your other um, stories that you have on your computer that we don't know about yet? Right. What are your inspirations? We'll be here for a while if you go here. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> um, so my subconscious plays a really big role in that. Uh, with The Host particularly, it was not a dream, but it was a road trip. And the idea was just kind of, like I was in the middle of thinking about it before I thought, where did that come from? It was just there. Oh. It was already into the idea of like one person, two people inside of one person in love with somebody else, both of them. And I'm like, oh, it'd be so complicated. And how would that work? And it's like, why am I thinking about this? But what a story, let's go. And, and so that with that one, um, it kind of worked that way. With uh, The Chemist was kind of unusual because that one was inspired by my love of action movies and kind of espionage things. And the two of us, and she is very much to blame, the two of us got very into The Bourne Legacy, not the Matt Damon one, um, the little offshoot that had like sci-fi in it. Sci-fi is a huge hook for me. Um, and Jeremy Renner was a huge hook for her. <laughs> um, but, uh, so we liked that so much that kind of is, was it a birthday thing or was it just kind of, it would, I, I wrote a sequel, a short novella sequel to what happened in that movie. And it was so much fun writing the actiony stuff and guns and, and, you know, running. And it was, it was super fun. I'm like, I want to write an actiony book. I want to write an espionage book. I can do this. Um, and so then and she did. And the chemist is what came out of that that kind of mindset of I want to do this, which is not usually how stories come to me. That was a, that was a whole new thing, kind of. The chemist too started. The seed of the chemist has started a lot earlier, pre pre Jeremy Renner. Oh, you're, you're, yeah, on, the, the the basic thing. We were on set, and uh, or breaking dawn. Breaking dawn was filmed both movies at the same time, and. We were, we were in this cold like bay where they the trucks drive in to drop stuff up and we did this a lot we talked about making different movies while we were on the set like we can make this i remember once there was a found footage santa claus movie that was someone else's <laughs> there was a serial killer movie that i was working on with the video guy um like that so you're doing this all the time and and i and i think the idea of like following a, a torturer an interrogatist for the story and have them be the protagonist started there. And then when I was like, I want to write this story, I went back and, yeah. and grabbed that idea. So that one was kind of unusual. A lot of the ones in my computer are more like the host. I think that's the most normal version for me. I do have two that were dreams. Well, they were both nightmares. Oh. Uh, <laughs> inspired them. I have very vivid dreams. And a lot of times I'll wake up in the middle of the night and be like, 
to, to shake up the nightmare, I kind of have to write out the rest of what happens. And sometimes right. it's worth writing down. Um, the most recent one was driving in the car and just a mythology point that kind of just came to me. And it was a, a fantasy avenue that I've never found a story for, but I've always loved reading. And I was like, oh, here it is. This is how you make this your own. This is how you make your mythology here. So that happens when I'm driving a lot. But oh, those wow. are, so dreams and driving, and then the chemist is the weird non-version. <laughs> Cold I did love the chemist. Oh my gosh, I love the chemist. It was so much fun to write. So yeah. much fun. Okay. All right. Thank Thanks. You so much. Much. Good question. Yeah, that was fun. Um, Elizabeth would like to know: Did you ever cry while writing any of the Twilight novels? Or I would say any of your novels. Oh, I was going to go there too because though I have cried a little bit, like tearing up. Um, a little bit with New Moon. Sometimes I think I cried with New Moon just because I'm just so sad <laughs> writing this book. When will it end? Um, but the one that I that really physically hurt with the tears and the aching in my throat was uh, The Host. And that was at a couple points. Um, when Walter died, uh, when, when Wanda is saying her goodbyes and knowing that she's, that she's going to die and give up her life for Melanie, just the yeah, hurt. Really the hurt. Um, speaking of the host, lots of people, Madeline, Justin, Amanda, Catherine, Rhonda, probably some people, other people whose names I've missed. Do you think that you will ever publish the sequel to the host? I would love to. And this is something that I say to people. Well, when there are two kinds of people, I always say there are people who want to have written a book in the past tense you know, I'd like to be a writer. I'd like to have a book out. And then there are people who like to write and they're two separate things. Um, when it comes to the sequel to this host, I have turned into the first person. I would love to have it done. I know the whole story. For some reason, when I sit down to write it, and maybe it's because I know the story too well and there isn't a lot of room for creation, I just am hitting a wall with that one. I'm gonna have to force myself to do it, but I know that that's yeah. not gonna happen next because I need, okay, after Midnight Sun, I need the kind of break where I have total creation ability there's nothing in my way i'm tied to nothing and i can just yeah but it just has to be free creating um tying to this a little bit quickly uh anna would like to know any any chance we'll get another book in the chemist universe it's possible Lori might want to know too <laughs> she might um it's possible i'm gonna say that May I can't say. I'm no. not going to say anything more. I don't have. I don't have anything written, like not even an outline for that. So that would be like really far away if it happened, but probably not in that format. Also, you don't want to put Daniel through anything else. Well, that's that is the problem. <laughs> that is the problem with the sequel to the chemist. Daniel's been through enough. They're happy. If I write, I have to break up that happiness. I've got to mess them up again, and I'm just not quite willing to do that. Okay, Dulce is next, and we're gonna call her is in. Dulce or Dulce? Well, she we'll can find tell out. Us. There she is. Hi. Is it I'm Dulce? In or the car. Dulce? It's Dulce. Dulce, very pretty. Dulce. Well, welcome, Dulce. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. All right. So you had a question about um, continuing continuing stories in the Twilight Saga. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, in particular, Renessa May and, and Jacob. Okay, so you want to know what's, if there's any, anything coming next? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so um, I have a pretty detailed outline for the next book in the series. I'm not going to write that next. Um, like I said, I need something brand new. Uh, but it would be narrated, half of the narration will be from Renesmee's perspective. And when I was doing Breaking Dawn, a lot of people were like, <gasps> a baby? Why are you bringing a baby into this? Come on, just stay with the story. But the reason I brought a baby into it is because I was creating my next narrator. So I knew all along that I needed someone who wasn't a vampire, who wasn't, who was kind of an outsider. I tend to write from an outsider's perspective. It's just I think we all feel like that a lot, like we don't really fit in. And Renesme certainly doesn't fit in. Um, so she's the perfect one. And then the other narrator will be Leah, because there's a lot of story for her left. She's kind of in a rough place and has been for years and might get a little rougher. Yeah. <laughs> but, 
but so there'd be that one and then there'd have to be a, a at least one more final book i think um but i don't have that one as solidly planned out it's more of the ending of that one the ending of the where it would go but again that's stuff that i would have to get to in a long time from now a lot of people ask too um about other stories for other characters right and like i said before i'm yeah. not going to write alice and jasper's love story um because it's in the past i know what happens the ending is already determined but in the in the it's gone the guide to twilight which is several years old you get some real insight into those things and then they made the the movies that we did with women in film and tongle and, and lionsgate um put the brought those to life in short films and so that's another good place if you're, you're itching for more alice and jasper yeah. but thanks dosey thanks for your question it was it really nice was. Thank you. <laughs> okay um um, let's see. Sorry, I'm getting I'm getting so many texts. Uh, Rebecca <laughs> would like to know: once things lift up, do you think you'll consider doing a bookstore tour to visit um, all of the favorite stories people? Sent I mean, <laughs> I would love to go to bookstores. I love bookstores, and I would like the one of the big things about this contest is you gave me a bunch of places I really want to go to now. <laughs> Um, I don't know if I would do an official tour. Um, you know, the publisher tends to run those things as they make sense for publishing and sales. Um, so, but maybe a rogue one, or maybe I wait till my next book comes out and do something official. I'd, I'd like to go some some new places because uh, a lot of my tours have kind of been to the same. And, and, and if you look at a map of the US and the population, I'm going to the places where the most people are. And so it makes sense but I would like to see some new places and faces. Okay, Emma, we're bringing oh. in Emma, I think. Try. We're gonna try. See? Is that Emma? Hey! <laughs> <laughs> nice dramatic, reveal. <laughs> dramatic reveal. <laughs> All right, go for it. So, you had a um, okay. Uh, my question was kind of, um, what tips or advice would you give to someone who would want to start writing? Like how to begin, how to get through the struggles that you might okay. face? Um, so I think the main thing, if you want to write, is to write. To not think about publishing or readers or whatever else might be clouding your brain, but just, just the story, just the story you want to tell yourself. Entertain yourself because if you were not entertained by your book, no one else is gonna be. Just don't worry about, I, I remember once I was with a group of writers who will be unnamed. And uh, I, I heard a couple of writers saying, what's the next big thing? Like we've done, we've done dystopia to death. What, what, what are we doing now? What are we doing now? And they were talking about different mythology things that they could do. And I was like, what a weird way to write a story. Like what's the hot thing? Um, and and I, I, that, I don't work that way. And I, I think that, maybe it's just my biased opinion i think it's better when the story is just kind of purely from you mm -hmm. and that you are just um it's what you want to tell and it's what's at the forefront of your brain on the tip of your tongue and that you want to type type it up there will be times where it's hard to get there and do the typing and you'll hit a block where you're like okay and well this is how my blocks work some people have hit blocks where they don't know what's going to happen next i always know that but how do i say it where are the words you know or, or these two characters wouldn't this doesn't work there has to be another way around it um i think sometimes it's good to take a little space but don't take too much space uh walk away if you have to but always come back and then when you've finished and you love it like when you're done you should love reading through it you should open it up and it should be like your favorite book you should just love getting in there then find a really good friend and have them tell you what's working and what doesn't you know ask good questions say at what point did you get bored at what point did you think this was going to happen instead of this um get it all polished up pretty and then find yourself an agent a good way to look is to find a book that is like in a similar genre um and look in the back and see who their agent was because they'll always thank them in the back um and if, then if they're a good agent if they're a good agent <laughs> yeah. i guess i always thank mine she's a great agent um and then start start sending submissions out because agents really smooth the way that's the way to go with i think instead of going straight to a publisher um but like all of that stuff, there's information about it all over online. You know, how to write queries, how to do this, how to do that. 
the writing is where your brain should be. Just write and then write and then write. Hopefully okay. that's helpful. All right. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank, you. Thank you so much. I was expecting a dramatic <laughs> <Excellent>. outro. <laughs> okay, we're gonna bring in somebody else, Bree. Ooh. Or Brianna. I have I have both names written here, so I guess she'll tell us what she prefers when she comes. Oh god. Oh god, she's scared. <laughs> Don't be scared. Okay. We're so nice. Hopefully, can you hi. Okay. Oof, I'm yes. starting to zoom all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you had one of my favorite questions, and it's about uh, Broadway musicals. Oh. Okay, so Broadway loves to do adaptations. I feel like it's a lot of Broadway, but and my friends and I talk about it all the time how the say it out loud vampire part would be such a great cut to intermission. Like everything goes to black intermission in the baseball scene and I feel like people fly over the audience regardless but <laughs> would there ever be a Twilight musical well I mean if it's a musical then then the you don't cut to intermission that's when you go to a song like that's a big musical number right there um I don't know I I so early on before I was with Summit before we made the films with uh with them and then Lionsgate. Um, there was uh, another attempt to make it and there was a script that, oh. that was so bad. <laughs> that was so bad. It was different. Uh, it was very... Okay, so <laughs> none of the clones existed except for Edward and his parents and their names were, um, what was his? Abel and Esteem were his parents. The FBI uh, was tracking mm -hmm. vampires up and down the Wasatch Front. Yeah. And that was a big part. There was a mm -hmm. speedboat chase. Yeah. And in the end, Bella yeah. goes into a warehouse to save Charlie with heat night vision goggles and she's packing heat. I think she's wearing leather too. And she had leather pants. This is all, so that experience shaped me <laughs> <laughs> as someone who is not always willing to adapt. Um, with Twilight and Summit, Eric Feig was the head of Summit then, um, and he did a lot of things that most heads of, of a movie house would not do. And he said, look, write down everything that can't change, and that's, that's our Bible, and we'll go with it. And I'm like, okay. And, uh, and then, so they did. And I'm like, all the characters have to exist. You can't kill anybody that doesn't die in the books. We created people to kill because that's important to Hollywood. You've got to kill people. <laughs> but um, it was pretty great. And they, and they were very honest about their intentions to make the book into a movie in a way that reflected the book. You, but that's not always the way. So a musical, what if I say, yes, do a musical, and then we get the Bella in, in leather pants version. I'm always a little worried. So I'd probably have to see see it first before I said yes, which is a lot of work to do for something you might not get paid for, right? Um, but it'd be interesting. Like I would, the perfect one I would love to see, right? The theming, the possibility for theming is endless. Um, <laughs> it really is. Do you write music yourself? Oh, absolutely not, but. <laughs> so you're like me, like you love the idea of it, but I can't yeah. create it myself. That's okay. Yeah. We just talked about the break to intermission. People would sit team Edward, team Jacob, like a wedding. Oh, but what if it turned into a fight then as you so pushed out the sides? Yeah, so oh. What if one side was all one person and then there was like one person. There's one guy sitting in the middle of Jacob's, <laughs> yay. <laughs> and, well, that's a very good question. And like I said, I have reservations, but it is something in a good form that I would love to see. Well, that gives me hope then. Thank you right. so much. <laughs> You're welcome. All okay. right. Awesome. This is working. I it's love it. working. And we are, we're going into our first hour. So we're going to try and we got to kind of okay. right. speed through some of these. Um, uh, let the, as I tell you to speed through, I've now lost my place. Um, what was your favorite scene to write from Edward's point of view? Who asked? Leah. Leah. Okay, Leah. So I think my favorite, like I was saying before, is the car chase scene because that was when the story picked up so much with the ability to create it that it was moving fast again. And I was, I mean, I think, so I said Midnight Sun took me like two years. I mean, Midnight Sun, well, the Meadow scene took me like two years to write. I believe that chapter, it is shorter, but it took me like a night because, well, it was probably two nights, but when it's moving fast, it's so much more exciting. And so I did love writing that. It was great. 
this is a good question to go um, into Diana, who we're going to pull up um, while she's pulling up, because specifically you wrote that scene to music. I did. And Diana has a question about um, how you use music as an inspiration. And there's Diana. Hi, Hi Diana. Oh. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. And my question, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous and shaky. You're great. You're great. My question is, how do you use music as an inspiration to write? And what is the process of that selection? Okay. So there's a couple different ways. And see, I'm going to talk too long again. Um, <laughs> so one is, and this happens to me a lot, is I'll be listening to a song in the car. Um, and it will speak to me so clearly about a character at a certain point in the story. And if that point hasn't been written yet, um, sometimes it gives me like shades of emotions. There's more there and I'm, I'm seeing more sides to their perspective as I'm listening to the song. Um, and that happens occasionally. And then that song usually makes it onto my playlist because it was a formative song. But I don't listen to it while I'm writing because generally words in songs is too much. It's too much distraction. Um, I listen to a lot of score. Um, and then uh, the race car scene is a great example because um, on my playlist, I've got some Aphex Twin, I've got some Portishead. Um, and those I was listening to because they don't, well, Portishead has words at the beginning, but the, the instrumental part is like this like, thump, 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 thump. And like I, and I, that's what I was feeling as I was writing. And so it kind of keeps me writing fast because I'm pacing myself to the music. Um, so that's generally more when I'm like actually listening and writing. The rest of it's more formative. Like it's while I'm listening, I'm not writing, but it's giving me more information about the character and more emotion for the scene. So it's like the two song things that happen. Okay. And it's great. It's great when you're in the car, you hear a new song and you're like, ah, it's yeah. Jacob. I hear Jacob in the song. It's great. I love that. Thank you so much. Great question. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, Taylor uh, would like to know. So there's a lot of the I, the kids. <laughs> this world. The kids are calling this the Twilight Renaissance. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of like Twilight TikToks and and. Uh, memes and fan fiction and and also like really cool t-shirts and stickers stickers are a thing now um taylor would like to know have you seen any of it and what do you think of all that stuff it sounds really cool i haven't one of the things that makes my life like possible and writing possible is i don't have any social media i am i am like I said, isolated. <laughs> in some ways, it's a really good thing because I know that I have the ability to get addicted to things. And this is why I ration my TV watching because I need to stay focused so I can write. Um, but it's fun to know that stuff's out there. And that's one of the things that really bugs me about not having a tour because if we were on tour, I could have seen all of it. we'd see the t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> and I love the t-shirts. You see, we... Method will send a few things through yeah. sometimes. Sometimes I see. I'm we not saw some cute much. pictures from the drive-in theater mm -hmm. events. People had cute stuff on. And I, I love that stuff. But I usually see it in real life yeah. is when I'm exposed to it. And then also there have been a few things recently like Cherish, Cherish a song. Yes. And people will, people will tell me when they're like, you have to hear the song this girl write, wrote that's amazing. Yeah. And, and that's how I'll find out about it. But she knows most of the time. She won't do that unless the song's really amazing because she knows she's not supposed to distract me and she wants to read stuff too. I really do, guys. I need something new to read. Um, okay, how, this is from Caitlin. How excited were you to finally be able to show fans Edward's point of view? Um, I'm never really excited. I was nervous. I'm always terrified because what if everybody hates it? And sometimes people do like that's a real thing i know that that can happen um this book is is sad and there's a lot of angst and and what if it's just too much for everybody so i am doing circles in my head about how awful it's going to be and i expect the very very worst so that i can't be negatively surprised um so no it's not excitement when a book comes out <laughs> for me it's a it's a and then when people are nice about it and like everybody gets excited about it coming out, then that's amazing. It's like, oh, they're so nice. They're so nice to me. My, my favorite part of talking about this has been your experience versus Method's experience the day that the the announcement came out, or not, not 
not the announcement. Yeah, the, the announcement. announcement that, yeah. Like someone's going to come. Yeah, we because you had the countdown page for a couple of days, and then um, the website crashed. <laughs> And Stephanie was having a really great day. And like, oh, people still want to know. That's nice. <laughs> the rest of us were like, ah. <laughs> so anyway, it was fun. Um, Cassandra and a lot of other people had a sort of very, Tina, Alicia had a variation on this question. Who's your favorite Twilight character? Okay, that's just mean. What is with you people? <laughs> People and favorites. Um, I've been doing this for a couple weeks here and I get this question a lot. And like, would you people come up to me in the grocery store and say, so which of these kids here with you is your favorite kid? You don't pick favorites with your characters. I mean, obviously there are some that are, you have your villains and whatnot, even though you probably should love them a little because otherwise they won't be fully formed. For sure. But I don't have favorites. I love them all in different ways, just like my children, because they're different people, but they all are worthy of love. Okay, our next person we're gonna call in, her name is Cassie, and she has a very, Cassie. she has done a very nice thing um, and given her question to a friend of hers that they, were, they share, um, Oh. A uh, a book a Twilight book club. So oh, how I'm gonna cool! Let her chat because it's a very Hi. sweet story. Cassie, can you hear me? I can. There you are. Hi. Hi. I actually have a few members on here today. So hello, everybody. Um, we <laughs> we have a uh, Twilight book uh, group, Facebook group of over a thousand people, and I wanted to share this experience with everybody. So. Um, <laughs> One of the questions that was asked was, in the past, um, you had stated that you weren't really much into horror books or horror films. I know you're into a lot of sci-fi. Um, Fickle Fish Films did produce Down a Dark Hall, so has your, has your um, like changed for that at all? Okay, so I still don't like horror. I still don't consume horror if I can help it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't consider Down a Dark Hall horror. It's suspense with ghosts, and I love a ghost story. I don't love a ghost story that ends with like knives and slashing and blood. I like the atmospheric, creepy ghost story. And that was what down burning at our a house. house. Burning a house down. Burning the house down Everyone is fine. That's fine. Um, it's okay. Um, so I, I, I love the creepy stuff. I love the, the gothic. Um, but when it's just about like, you know, somebody with knives for hands, scraping up teenagers, um, it's not my thing. So I, I don't think that I, I don't think that was my crossover into horror. I think I've stayed very strongly on the side of suspense. Give me Hitchcock and that, and I'm good. That kind of thing. All right. Awesome. Did I get it? Absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. Say hi to your whole group for me. I think that's very I cool. I absolutely will. And also, nice t-shirt. See, I got Thank to see you. a t-shirt. That's good. <laughs> cool. Yes. Oh, that is a good one. That is a good one. Where is that t-shirt from? Uh, Bookish Box. Okay, we'll remember so we'll that. Write that down. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Cassie. Um, okay, well, oh, we have that question already. What was the, this is from Lizbeth, what was the original spark for your books, the like single moment you knew you wanted to write them? You sort of touched on this a little bit, but I think people I mean, look for a magical reason. It's pretty magical for me. Uh, I Like I was saying before, most of my books come to me just out of some weird place in my subconscious. As a kid, I was always telling myself stories. If I didn't have a book to read, I would look out the window on the long car trips. There were six of us in the car, well, six kids, two parents. <laughs> this was before they had TVs and cars to watch. Um, and everybody was just fighting and punching each other the whole time. And I can't read in cars because I have horrible motion sickness. So I would just stare out the window and I'd tell myself stories. And I thought everybody did that. And I didn't know it wasn't totally normal. Um, but I, I, so I've always kind of done that. I didn't think about writing them. Uh, there are a lot of ideas in my idea bank that uh, don't get made into books. So I guess you kind of have to decide from that spark of like, ooh, a story which ones are worth the effort of writing down and a lot of it comes into which ones won't leave your head which ones keep you up at night i was actually up last night with something and i could not sleep and i had an early morning meeting and the fault. words were there and i hate that but i love it so yeah. you, know, you just kind of have to go with what your mind is making you do maybe you don't have a choice <laughs> <laughs> uh, madison would like to know what advice do you have on creating character um, and character development. 
uh, I have horrible advice because I am not, uh, I don't do that super consciously. Um, for me, some characters come 100% developed. Alice was that way. Once Edward had a sister, which was pretty quick, you know, I read, wrote the meadow scene, um, and then, then there was his family, and they were going to meet his vampire family, and his family appeared, um, and Alice just was. And I know, I don't know anyone like Alice in real life. She is her own original person. Rosalie took a little bit more. Um, she was stunning, and I knew that, and there was an edge to her, and it took me a minute of writing where she wasn't coming through till I realized, oh, she doesn't like Bella, and then her whole character came, mm -hmm. and so it's just it's this weird thing where I just get a sense of who they are and then everything floods in. Like once you have the core of them, it all just floods in. I would not be able to do it. And I've seen sheets on how to develop a character. What's your character's favorite? This, how would they feel about this? I would be terrible at that. I would not be able to succeed. So I'm glad that my brain is weird. Uh, okay. Bronwyn, we're going to bring you in. Ooh, Bronwyn, great name. And she has a question about first person POV. Okay. Hello ladies. No Can you, there's, there's, awesome. Hi. Can you hear me? Hello. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So um Stephanie, you do a great job of writing a first person point of view in all your books. I was just wondering, is there a reason you don't write from other characters so do multiple first person point of views in your books first time around? Um I think it's I mean, like with Twilight specifically, I mean, that's the experience that we all have. None of us experience our life and then have other people jump in and have take over for a little while. Like we only get one person's perspective. So that felt really natural. Like if you were living this book, that's how you would live it. Um, and then, you know, I've experimented with having Jacob's perspective when he was having a lot more action than Bella was. Um, and I have experimented with taking a step back with the chemist and not having a first person perspective, although I stayed very tightly on her. It just doesn't feel like a real lived experience um, when you're getting outside things because we don't get that. Uh, and I love to read books that are that way, but writing them, it just doesn't feel like a, a real experience. And maybe I'll learn how to do that someday. I'd love to learn how to do more things, more tricks. I need more tricks. <laughs> but that's an awesome question. Thank you so much, Roman. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Okay, um, Marcy and Megan had a question about our, what new books are you working on right now? I'm not going to tell you. Um, <laughs> I have, and it'll probably be something different than I think. I think when I get done with Midnight Sun things and I can concentrate and I watch Umbrella Academy too, um, I think there are three that I am wavering between. There's one that I started typing on over the summer. Um, but then it's not sci-fi and it's not fantasy and it's like historical. And I'm not sure that that'll be able to pull me in enough. Um, and then I have a fantasy book that I've been working on for quite a while and there's a good section done. So that would probably be the easiest one to go and finish. And I don't know everything that happens, which helps because I don't, I know where we're getting to, but I'm not exactly sure how we're gonna get there. And so that intrigue helps. And then there's one that's like this brand new idea. And I don't know if I want to jump into the brand new idea. It's hard to just decide. That one's fantasy too. There are lots of options. Okay, Emily, we're going to pull you in. I think. There's Emily. Hey. Hi, Emily. Hi. Emily has a question about theme songs. Yes. Okay. So you have amazing playlists for your your books that you create. So I want to know, what is the theme song of Stephanie Meyer? What song, what song does really get you pumped? Like, you know, you turn it on when you're jamming in the mornings. Um, yeah. So oh man, it thing. changes so much. It is like literally a week to week deal. But it's funny because we've noticed a thing that happens when we're in the car together is that the mix that we're playing somehow knows our mood. Our feelings. Um, we, mm -hmm. we noticed at first we were working on Breaking Dawn and it had kind of gotten to be a slog, like early morning, super cold and wet. And we had so little to finish and we're like, oh, we just gotta get through this. And OK Go would keep coming on with like these, you know, you, you can get through it. This isn't gonna, gonna be OK. It's gonna be OK songs. We're like, how does it know? And the other day we were 
stressed out and kind of bummed, well, we found out we'd been exposed to COVID. And it's like, we have to cancel everything and everything sucks. And every song that came through, I tell you, was like this, you know, sad songs like Travis and stuff. And it like, was legit Travis, not like there was, was a lot Travis, of Travis going, why does it always rain on me? And yes. You know, like, yes, Travis, why? <laughs> so the, the, the theme songs kind of follow <laughs> us around. Right now, this today, what I was listening to was uh, Portishead Dummy. It's a fantastic album, really good. So that's my today's theme song, but tomorrow it'll be something new. Um, <laughs> do you have a song that's like the yeah, song yeah. Oh, over oh, periods Toxic of time? Toxic by Britney Spears. Like, <laughs> Always, always, always. I feel like I've learned something about you, Emily. <laughs> yes, Emily. That's kind always. of cool that you wore your song. Emily. I wonder if everybody, you, I, I don't know if it's hard to make one of those um, posts, but is it people know their songs? Like, is that a thing? That's kind of cool. Wait, I have more questions. <laughs> Emily, is it because you feel like you were toxic or is it because the song takes you back to a moment in time that you really No, enjoy? it just takes me back to a moment in time. It's got like a really good beat, you know, you just turn it on and okay. you could kind of just get pumped for your day. Okay, yeah. that, that's a good answer. That's I was a, a good <laughs> We're gonna have to have another conversation. <laughs> 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 Awesome. Okay. Great question, Emily. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Oh, I um I ha I saw a question here um from Janet and I'm I think she left out a few things, but it's about the how the um Alice's vision in Breaking Dawn um, in the book versus the movie, how that sort of came together. Okay, well, story time. <laughs> um, so while we were making Eclipse and I was getting uh, Breaking Dawn ready for publication and the movie people were like hounding me, just give me an early copy, just let me see it. It's like, no, no, I don't, I don't wanna risk leaks. I, you can read it when it comes out, but let me just say now, I apologize. <laughs> Because I knew like Renesme was going to be uh, difficult to do, and it was. It was really hard. Um, but the thing that was their big hang-up when they uh, finally got the book was like, well, we have to have a fight at the end. And they did this in New Moon too. Um, and I didn't have a lot of involvement in that. And I'm just like, oh, they're going to beat up Edward. Like, I'm sorry, but if if Felix was beating up Edward and he was incapacitated by Jane, it would not have gone as well for him as it did in that movie. <laughs> Um, so I'm like, you know, we can't have a fight because let me tell you what happens if we have a fight. I mean, you can have your fight, have your fight, but everybody dies. All right. So Edward and Bella are dead. And so then when I write a sequel, okay, it's going to be 20 years. Mm -hmm. But if, you know, this happens, a Game um, of Thrones situation. how are you going to do that sequel? Because you've killed everyone. So that stymied them a little bit. And mm -hmm. they're like, well, but we got to have a fight. So we're going to do a fight, but no one's going to die. I'm like, that's not realistic. Because if the, the Volturi actually commit to a fight, everybody dies. There's a reason why it's a standoff in the book and not a fight, because I was not ready to kill everybody yet. Yep. Um, so after going some rounds, I went out to dinner with Melissa Rosenberg, the writer, with the mission of we are gonna figure this out. Um, and so, and I, I'd had an idea of Alice's visions, but I'm like, it doesn't work because she can't see the wolves. The wolves are there, it erases it, it can't happen. And I said that to Melissa and she's like, well, let's just make it happen. I'm like, but it's not right. And she's like, but then we get our fight. And she, I was like, you're right, you're right. Okay, I'm going to forget mythology, let it go. And we're going to have Alice show, because that is what happens in the, in the novel. She takes Arrow's hand, give me your hand, Megan, there, and shows him that he will not survive this fight, which is also true. Um, so, but she couldn't have shown him that clearly. Anyway, so we decided to go for it. And once I got over that little like, there's no way she could see this, um, it got really fun because then I got to kill everybody. And <laughs> when there's no like consequences, like I'm, I'm gonna keep them, I know that they're gonna come back in. Um, it was fun. And there was scenes that we had planned, we actually had to cut it down quite a bit from what we wanted to do because you can only have so long of a fight scene before people get bored. Um, so we, we didn't do all of the death scenes. Yeah, um, there were a lot of them. There were a lot, but we got to do them. And, and I'm gonna let Megan tell you about her favorite memory from watching Twilight films over all it the years. It should be everyone's favorite memory. <laughs> <laughs> For well, our memory. Were legitimately horrified. That's not a happy memory. Yeah, well, we had to keep a lot of things under wraps on on the Breaking Dawn movies. There were there were a lot of, there's a lot of, there was a wedding dress, there was a wedding, there were people in the river. 
trying to keep people. That wasn't part of the pictures, story. That was, was just yeah. security guards. <laughs> security guards. So there's a lot of things we're trying to keep secret, but that that her that twist was something that we all worked really hard to keep a secret. So when we were at the premiere, um, and everyone had this, you know, when when Carlisle's head pops off, <laughs> everyone had this physical and audible reaction. We it was you could feel it in the theater, like people. It was losing a big. Their <gasps> minds. And what? Yeah, and if you want a real good laugh, you can go on YouTube and like you go search Breaking Dawn audience reactions. It it just it brings me so much joy. <laughs> <laughs> to hear people think that we really that like you killed everyone <laughs> and, and i killed them all yeah but that it didn't anyway it was a nice anyway memory. so it ended up being fun yes there's yep. a mythology problem but it was it was worth it okay molly sorry i talked too much uh molly we're gonna call molly in we sort of touched on this question already but we're gonna we're gonna dive deeper i think side note my name was almost molly Mine too. Um, every one of me and my sisters. Okay, what is it with parents? They love the name Molly. That's every right. one of us was a Molly until it came down to it, and then they changed our names. Except for Molly. But Molly made it. Hi, Molly. Hey. Thank you so much for doing this. This is so exciting, and thank you so much for giving us Midnight Sun. It's been the best part of quarantine by far. <laughs> thank you so much. This is a really fun thing for me to actually get to like see some faces. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I have my LaPush shirt on. LaPush, baby. Vacation. That's your La favorite push shirt. My I love it. Push, push. Um, push. I'm like, I asked a couple questions, so I'm not sure which one you guys um, about, <laughs> You did. Okay, that's right. You did have a couple questions. I did. Sorry, it's not going to be. It was about um, Edward. Had Edward given up on finding love? Yeah. Just like when he finally kind of realized, like, oh my God, I'm in love. This is unbelievable. Like, until he had gotten to that point, just like, had he, like, I think, I don't think he was really looking for anything, but I just didn't know, like, had he just kind of given up on it? See, totally. I, I don't see him as, as, as ever saying, like, um, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm almost 100 now, and I guess love's not for me, you know, there's Tanya, but eh, I'm not feeling it, and I guess I'll just be alone forever. I don't see him ever having that internal conversation, because I feel like he'd be like, love is stupid. Like, all of you are idiots. He sees so much in people's brains. It, I mean, think about when you see somebody like making out and it's like gross because you don't know them. They're not gorgeous movie stars. I mean, they're all good looking, but like you, he has to live with that all the time. And honestly, I think he was kind of like, this is so beneath me. He probably appreciated romance in like classical novels better. Like that's how they do it. In real life, it's such a letdown. And, and I have everything I need in and of myself. I've never met a person that would add anything to what I've already got. Very arrogant, by the way, very yeah. arrogant. Yeah. Um, and so until, and he says in the book, like love always looks stupid until it's too late for you, basically. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I don't think he had given up on love, but I don't think he had any intention of looking for it either. He didn't feel like anything was missing. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you awesome. so much. <laughs> awesome, thanks Molly. Thank you. All right. Okay, Veronica would like to know <laughs> in a fight, this is a throwback question, 2008. In a fight, who would win, uh, Edward or Jacob? All right. <laughs> There's just no way that Jacob's fighting alone, right? Um, Jacob comes with friends. Jacob comes with friends, and they would not let him fight alone. Yeah. And like Edward also doesn't want to fight Jacob. Edward has always liked Jacob. And while, yeah, there have been some, some headbutting situations, Edward still feels like that's his fault, right? This is all on him. And, and he always thinks pretty highly. I mean, first of all, Jacob basically saved Bella's life in more than one way. Mm -hmm. um, he was a really good friend to her. Yes, he's a, he's a werewolf and that makes him hard to, you know, there's a danger element, but under his control and in his mind, he's been a wonderful friend for her. And his love for her is also very pure. And Edward would know that. Um, so he says a couple times, you know, he, he said, I've always thought of you as more of a comrade in arms. Like if they could be friends, Edward would be happy to be his friend because he genuinely admires Jacob. So getting them to fight, I'm going to bring up nerd stuff. So you've got Batman v Superman, right? We all know the Superman could destroy Batman. However, when they did it in the movie, like, you know, if they'd had a conversation, it never would have happened. But you know, Superman's reluctance to fight with Batman is why Batman has a minute to do anything. And that's how it would be. Edward's reluctance to fight with Jacob would give Jacob a real edge. 
um, if they were actually going at it and Jacob didn't have his pack with him for whatever reason, I mean, I think Edward's got a little bit of the advantage because all he has to do is bite him somewhere and that's going to incapacitate him with the whole venom poison effect that it does to werewolves. Okay, uh, good answer. Brittany, <laughs> we're going to bring in Brittany and while we wait for Brittany, I just want to point out that Tracy says, my mom and I were losing it in the theater until we figured out it was only a vision. I hope it was a fun experience for you. I wish we could have heard you scream. <laughs> <laughs> There's Brittany. Hi, Brittany. Hey. So Hi. Brittany had a writing question. All right. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for all your books and Twilight. That's actually the book that got me into reading and loving books. So that is thank awesome. You. I love people who start and then keep going. Yes. <laughs> Um, so my question is, as an author, what is your advice for taking what you see in your head for a story and putting it into words on a page? Um, so my biggest piece of advice for that is to be a reader. Like I learned to write from reading and I read voraciously my whole life. And so I had a sense of how words flow and I have this whole vocabulary of words that I don't even know how to say right because I've only, I've read them <laughs> yeah. in books. We both Me have too. this problem. Um, you can always tell a reader because they're going to say words wrong because they've read so many, but they haven't heard them aloud. Um, I think that reading really helps you get a sense of how to write. And, uh, and that I think is the only real training it. I mean, I did, I studied English. I wrote a lot of papers about books, but that's a very different and much more boring kind of writing. Um, I, reading was really the training that let me then put my thoughts into words. It can be really hard. Sometimes you see a moment so perfect and the words just are flat and not doing it. And I, I hate when that happens, it's a struggle. But my only real training is just reading everything I get my hands on for all of my life. I hope that helped, probably not very much. <laughs> that helpful answer. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. Okay, we're gonna go, oh, I feel bad, okay. <laughs> I feel bad moving on. And they're still yeah. screen. Okay, Pauline, we're gonna call Pauline in. Um, she had an Austin land question. Ooh, Austin land. Which is one of our favorite topics. One of our favorite experiences. She's coming. Um, There's Pauline. Almost. I see her name. We're getting we're so close. So close. There she there is. We go. Hey. Hi. Um, Thank you for doing this. I've, this is the third event of yours that I've attended and thank you very much. This is awesome. I'm so glad that we could do this tonight. Yeah, um, as a huge fan, not only of the Twilight Saga, but also of Austin Land, is there ever going to be a sequel and whose storylines would you focus on? For Austin Land? Do you, um, Austin know, Land? That, do you know that there's a sequel to the book, Austin Land? Well, it, no. Oh, okay. no, you didn't know that. Right so will there be a sequel film? So the sequel to Austin Land is called Midnight in Austin Land. And it's my favorite of the two books. Um, it's, I mean, Austin Land is great. And it, it created this whole very possible world that I want to live in where I can go to this place. But Midnight in Austin Land kind of takes it to a new place with mystery and um, don't ruin anything. Well. It's so <gasps> great. And uh, it would be so much fun to film. And so it's definitely something we'd like to do. I mean, we have to get a There's lot a, of things, lot a lot of ducks in a row. And a lot of people are like, oh, we want to give you millions of dollars to make this. Yeah. Let's do it. You know, <laughs> so we're waiting step. for that, that person. Um, but yeah, we would love to. Making Austin Land, uh, making all the movies were fun in their own way. But let me just tell you, if you're going to make movies for a living, make comedies. Because yeah. it is so much more fun than serious, angsty, all the actors are trying to get into this place where they can cry. No, no, let them tell you jokes. <laughs> it's way better. Yeah, and then also do it on a on an English, an old English. Oh man. yeah. Like do it and live in the English countryside. That's yeah. not bad either. Yeah. <laughs> we made the I perfect did a lot of movie. Rewinding. The, set was was that? Stu uh, the set was stunning. I did a lot of rewinding. Oh. Was Jennifer Coolidge part of the project from the beginning? Um, she was in a way, because when Shannon wrote the character, she always pictured Jennifer Coolidge. So it was such a score that we got her to do it. We were lucky that she had 
worked with Jared Hess before. So we had a connection to be able to get to her and be like, please, 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 because she is so amazing. And yeah. we were so lucky to get her. We really, oh, really she's were. the best. She's really, she's a yeah. good human being too. She is a good human being. She's awesome. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Holly. Thanks for asking about Ashland. Land. <laughs> Love that. Have a good night. Yes. We're getting, we're getting there. Um, okay. While we wait for some more, Josh would like to know, uh, his grandma and his mom write, and he wants to know what the deciding factor for you is to publish versus to write for your own pleasure, because he would like for his grandma and his mom to publish. Ah, that's really sweet. Um, and maybe you can do something about that, Josh, because I would not have published except for my big sister. Um, to me, that seemed so incredibly presumptuous to think that anyone would ever want to read anything. The only reason my sister had read anything was because she was tired of me not returning her phone calls and she's just like what gives stephanie what are you doing why aren't you talking to me um and i'm like okay so i'm writing a story don't tell anybody it's just a thing with vampires um <laughs> vampires was a surprise for my sister anyway she's like oh i want to read something send it to me and i was it was very scary for me even with a sister who loved me very much to send it to her but i did and it, her reaction was like, she's the best fan ever. Like her reaction was, give me more, give me more. And it made me feel more confident about it because she was very positive. And then she was the one that said, you've got to do this. You've got to try and get it published. And it's like, oh, but it's so scary. And she, she's like, do it. Other people are going to want to read this. And that, that wasn't helpful because the thought of other people reading it really held me back. But, but her enthusiasm just try, just try, she said. And it's like, you know, if no one picks it up, you haven't lost anything except some stamp money. And uh, and so I did try. Um, and a lot of it was her enthusiasm. So maybe your enthusiasm can help your mom and grandma to get there. Okay, uh, we'll bring in this, uh, Celia. So she's, it looks like she's here. Celia. There she is, she... see her name. You were so close. Start my video. Yeah, here we go. It's coming. It's happening. Oh, there she hey. is. Hi. Hey. Hi. How are y'all? We're great. Uh, How are you? <laughs> I'm good to say thanks. Um, I don't, do, can I just, I think I remember my question. Yeah, go for it. For it. Um, I think it was across all the different books that you've written, because I, I mean, I do love Twilight, but I've read like the other books, I think multiple times, and I've only read the Twilight series once. Um, what was your, it's, it's such a like pick your favorite kid kind of question, but <laughs> what was your favorite scene to like write out of all the things that you've written so far that have been published, obviously? But. Right. Um, so Twilight was in a lot of ways the favorite because it was so easy. I wrote it in three months. It was like the story just poured into me and I didn't have to work. It was, I had to stay up a lot, but I didn't have to work very hard. And I love things that I don't have to work hard for. Um, but I feel like probably my best work is the host. And while I was writing it, it felt more important in kind of a weird way. And I, I, just wished I could be Wanda. I wished I could be that good. And so I, I really admired her and that was a, a part of that experience. Um, but, but just for ease and fun of writing, you know, Twilight wins hands down. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thanks for coming. Right. Um, okay. Let's see. Ro uh, this is from Felicia. Rosalie, there's a lot of Rosalie questions. This well, I think Midnight oh, Sun has some some new Rosalie really. looks and, and things with Rosalie. Mm -hmm. So it makes you think about her anyways. Um, she would like to know, uh, Rosie, did Rose, Rosalie initially hate Carlisle for changing her? And how long was it before she was able to forgive him? And this is one of those things like with how the human, well, the human and the vampire mind, human nature, vampire nature, um, uh, she never hated Carlisle. Um, Carlisle is extremely difficult to hate. <laughs> he is just so good and kind and he was so sorry. You know, he knew that he had acted, uh, quickly that he had, that he had acted, you know, I'm losing my words. Um, I can't think of the right word I want, but you know, he hadn't thought through what he was doing. He just, it was spontaneous and he just, his gut instinct was to save her. Um, but then she wasn't super happy. It wasn't like Esme where Esme woke up and like, yeah, let's do this, you know, and Emmett had a similar thing later. Um, with Rosalie, all of the, the things that Carlisle felt when he was changed, she feels 
Um, and he feels horrible about that. And she doesn't blame him. The funny thing is, is because Edward had nothing to do with her getting changed. He wasn't there. He shows up. It's already happening. She resents him. She kind of <laughs> takes her resentment and puts it on the guy who's super annoying because Carlisle's lovely and Esme's lovely and they're so kind to her. And then here's Edward. Word, snarky being as hell. this snotty <laughs> little brat about yeah. it. Ugh, Rosalie Hale. Like, and he's a huge tattletale. He's such a know-it-all. He does everything right. Like, he is very annoying for her. And uh, and so she kind of all the resentment went on him, even though she knows she's not confused about how it happened. She knows it's not his fault, but he's where the resentment goes. So that's part of why they they had a difficult relationship. Also, their personalities just are not mm -hmm. easily going together. All right. Um, okay. Let's see. What Angie would like to know, what are some of the favorite books you've read over the past couple of years? All right. So my most recent love is um, The Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells. Uh, the first one's called All Systems Red. Sometimes I get confused trying to find like what order they're in, and I get the names confused. But All Systems Red is where you start. They're very short, you'll tear through them. Um, for me, that was like really great sci-fi where this character who is a killing machine and also is super introverted and has a lot of social anxiety and I just got him, man, or her, him, it was, it's an it. Um, totally made, like touched a part of my soul, <laughs> the murder bot. Um, and I love those books. Uh, and then, uh, more a little bit further back I've been talking about Lainey Taylor for a while and if you have not done yourself the favor of reading Lainey Taylor get on it because Strange the Dreamer is beautiful and strange and wonderful and unlike anything else I've ever read and what a mythology what a world I can't say enough good things about Strange the Dreamer and then you have to read all her other books too and they're all amazing she just has this magical touch. Mm -hmm. If I could be another writer, like steal someone's skills. Sorry, Lainey, I'm coming for you. <laughs> um, okay. Colleen wants to know, are there any snack foods you like to eat while you're <sighs> writing? I wish. I have a lot of weird diet restrictions because my body is strange and does not process things correctly. But you have one, your go-to thing while you're writing. My go, I was getting there. Oh, sorry. So I don't eat while I'm writing. I chew gum and I have a big drawer full of many flavors, which grosses her out. She will only do mint flavored gums. She's missing out. Yeah, but do you need chocolate, banana, pudding? It's chocolate mint flavored. Okay. I, did, I would not okay. chew banana gum. That's disgusting. <laughs> but I have all the sugar-free gum. And when I'm writing, I go through it like a chain smoker, lighting the last cigarette with the first one. And I'm just like throwing it away and putting the, the next, the, the used piece in the wrapper of the next one. And I don't even realize how much gum I'm chewing until I have to like refur refurbish the drawer and put in a whole nother, whole nother round. But yeah, I just chew a lot of sugar-free gum. Okay, we're nearing the end here. Um, Annie would like to know what Twilight merchandise do you own? Well, um, I'm not sure about all of it. It was kind of, uh, it's kind of haphazard what they send to me and what they don't. When the movies came out, I got a whole bunch of like the jewelry. And the let me tell you, I was a hit at those white elephant parties because <laughs> I would bring in like Rosalie's hair curlers. I'd have a backpack full of merch and everybody loved it. It was very popular. But the best things are those my old t-shirts I was gonna say the dolls oh well okay so I've got my Barbie dolls I grew up with Barbie I know there's issues for me it's just a pure nostalgia thing I love when I was little I would make clothes for Barbie and I loved it um and so having my own Barbies that are my characters that I got to have input on what they look like is super cool to me um I also have the t-shirts that we first made that I still love with our little slogans and images. And I've got like the remains of those in a bin somewhere. Yeah. And then I have a couple, you know, I've, I've got things that people have given me. And I think my favorite shirt that I remember, um, it had a cartoon on it. Somebody was a good artist and it was a little cartoony happy kid version of yeah. Jacob with Edward on the ground with the X eyes, you know, he's knocked out. He's got his foot on his neck and it says Jacob wins. And I thought it was hilarious. That's really good. Okay, Tara. You're the last one we're going to call in. Oh, okay. Sad thing. <laughs> we're, at, we're at the end. I see the name. There she is. Hi. Hello. Hey. Hi. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I'm a Jane Austen fan like you are. So, you know, it was so sad that poor Jane, you know, she didn't get to see all the love um, that you get to see from all the fans. So my question was, you know, how does it feel to have touched so many people in such a wonderful way? Like so many of us, it's just changed our lives in so many ways, brought us so much happiness. I can't imagine how that must feel for you. I mean, it's it's a crazy thing. I do think that Jane Austen had some fans though. Like people did appreciate what she was doing. So she got some love, which is good. Um, I find it like a really strange, I mean, there's wonderful aspects of it. It makes me feel like very shy sometimes that people are like, I love your books. I was like, okay. I mean, it just, I don't even know how to respond because I didn't think anybody ever would. And I, I got so much pleasure out of writing the books that it almost seems like too much to ask for anything more, right? Because I had that joy um, and it's amazing. And my, my favorite things are people who have found friends through Twilight. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love it when people um, didn't like to read and then they read Twilight and now they've read everything and they go find all the other books. And I love that. Um, I love like the mothers and daughters that have enjoyed doing that together. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's just I, the things, the connectors that happen, I, re, I really love. So it's kind of overwhelming, um, especially when people are like in mass, but when it's like this, where I'm talking to one person and, and there's like a manageable group of people, it just feels like a real, I mean, I was gonna say a sisterhood, but there are, it's a brotherhood too, because we have our, we have our boys in here that, are, that we love. Um, it's like this, this feeling of being just supported and loved by a big group of people. It's kind of amazing. So I am, always amazed and always humbled by having people find happiness in something I do. I'm very, very grateful that that, that makes uh -huh. that to bring anybody happiness is amazing. So thank well, we're you. We're grateful for you. And if you ever make it to the Charlotte, North Carolina area, All right. um, come out an escape room you inspired the name of it it's science fiction so oh. <laughs> we, we'd love to put you through it and, and have you play, of course on us of course to pay all this love you've given us thank you Charlotte, so much Sarah. Sarah. Thank, thank you, you. <laughs> North Carolina is beautiful it really is okay yeah. I'm gonna sneak in one question because I saw it a couple times so this okay. is from Eleanor would you ever make a movie or tv show based off a of life or death I would love to do that yeah Okay. I don't, nobody's knocking on my door on that one. Yeah. Uh, we have ideas though. But we have ideas. And uh, although it's hard because like all of our casting ideas are too old now. And so it's like, we can't have and them. Grace Kelly isn't around. Grace Kelly can't do, can't play any roles for us. So yeah, that makes it hard. Um, but yeah, cool. I, I do love that, that story just because in a lot of ways it gave me back like the purity of Twilight and got me able to write Midnight Sun. So I owe a lot to that story. Okay. Last question. Whew. You guys, you really did it. Dang, that went fast. Hour, hour and 45 minutes. Um, yeah, long time. Wow. Uh, this is from Katie. Uh, what is your favorite part about your fans? Well, I kind of went into that. I mean, I guess one of the things I really like about my fans is I've seen some real toxic fandoms. And generally, my experience with the fans and when I meet them and, and they're with their friends is there's a lot of kindness Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people who just, and maybe it's because, um, because Twilight is a gir girl thing. It's a story by a girl that's about a girl from a girl's perspective. We get looked down on a little bit, you know, I'm sure every one of you have had someone say, oh, you like that Twilight mm -hmm. book? You know, we're all aware of that. And I think maybe that makes us like kinder to other people because no one needs to be mean. And so right. we've been on the receiving end. And so it's like, I, I'm not going to judge anybody who reads a book that might not be my thing. I'm going to be like, oh, that's cool. Because there's room for all of us to love all different kinds of books. Um, and so I like the kindness. And everybody I've met has been pretty amazing. Like I've met some really, really cool people. I miss not being able to be out there doing that right now. Um, but this has been like a fun halfway measure, right? We've gotten, I've gotten to see your pretty, pretty faces, hear your voices. And that is awesome. I love answering your, your questions and kind of knowing what your reactions were to the books. That's a lot of fun for me. So um, thank you so much for being here tonight and being awesome people that I am proud to have as my fans because you guys are better than anybody else's. So thank you. <laughs> okay, guys, I think that 
that well this Wait, hold is on. one that Bonnie... I've got to, I've got to answer Ava's question really quick. She typed it in. Oh. I just caught my eye. Okay. Do you think that vampires exist? Ava, I don't. Um, and if they did, I wouldn't want to meet them because I'm guessing my shiny, nice version with morals is not how it would go. I am one voice among many per people who have described vampires. I don't yeah. want to meet the other kind. So I hope that they're not. Okay, this is the last thing I'm going to say because it's sweet. This is from Bonnie. She says, I have loved Twilight so much. I asked my husband of 39 years if I could call him Edward. He is a good sport and said, sure. Well, he's my Edward. It's very he's sweet. It's a, a very nice man. <laughs> my husband would not <laughs> react well to that. So he's a keeper. <laughs> okay, guys. Whew. Thanks for hanging out. That was in. so much fun. Thank you so much for being here and letting me hear from you. I appreciate it so much. You guys everyone are awesome. Thank Method too. Yes, for... thank you, Method. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank